Hello and welcome to the final edition of Newsbreakers here on Fios One News. I'm Andrew Whitman. When it was first announced back in September that Fios One would be closing down and that this weekend would be the final episode of Newsbreakers, I immediately tried to plot out who should be among our final guests. Thought about trying for some famous Westchester residents, even made some attempts to try for Bill and Hillary Clinton. Last weekend's guest was George Latimer. He was originally scheduled for this week, but I wanted to end this program instead where it began with the two gentlemen who helped me launch this program. Appearing for the first time since April, it is our original Newsbreaker panel, Democrat Richard Brodsky, Republican turned conservative Bill O'Reilly. I miss you guys. That's a long introduction. Too. That's a long introduction. Yeah. Just let's so get to it. Get how, you, else. how you guys doing? Oh, fine, thank Good. you. How are you? Good. Yeah. Yeah. We changed formats to go full interview after April, so it's been a while, and I've been looking forward to having the two of you back. So we could jump right into these topics. Like Let's start with Tuesday's elections. Tuesday, a good day for Westchester Democrats who gained another two seats on the county board. will now hold a 15 to two seat advantage in the county legislature. Two years ago, much of the credit for the Democrats winning the majority was given to push back against Donald Trump. Last week, I asked George Latimer how he would interpret election results. He said Democratic gains would be a sign of support for his and the Democratic agenda. Is this more than just an anti-Trump vote? Is this a vote in favor of the Democratic and Latimer agenda in Westchester bill? Meaning no disparagement at all to George Latimer, who's a very nice man. This is, this is coming from the national atmosphere. The, 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 oh. the atmosphere is so heightened right now that Democrats are voting straight Democratic ticket, Republicans are voting straight Republican ticket, and there's twice as many, more than twice as many Democrats as Republicans in the county. And the reason there are twice as many Re Democrats as Republicans is because the Republican Party has shot itself in every part of its anatomy except one. And it, the, the, you cannot run a political party as though they represented rural areas in upstate New York and expect it to thrive in the suburbs. George has done very well. He's consolidated those trends. He gets the credit for that. But the Republican Party is morte. I have, a, I have a question for you because in past generations there would be Democratic waves nationally, and, and Westchester still went Republican locally. There is a distinct there's a distinct difference in terms of the agenda on the local level, in terms of taxes and budget. Yeah, we've, we've been through this before. Most recently it was up from 2002 to 2008. It was incredibly difficult to run as a Republican in New York, and especially in, in Westchester. So why is it different now? Be because of the uh, I, and I, my theory always was it was the count. It was the Florida count that you worked on. And people and Democrats were really upset. In 2008, you could have run, you know, would, you know, you could have run Teddy Roosevelt and lost. But in 2009, it all changed. Except after you the, didn't after the run Obama Teddy election. Roosevelt. You run a series of right-wing candidates that are out of step. People are not stupid. They don't like the policies that the Republican Party has adopted. Now, they don't like Trump, and there are demographic changes. But you can't run as an anti-choice. Bail out the rich. Nothing to do with it. Pro gun party. It doesn't have anything to do it with it. It has nothing to do with it. In, two, in 2008, you could not elect a, a, a Republican in Westchester. In 2009, Rob Astorino, a conservative Republican, wins by 13 points based on Republican and, messages. And conservative the voter messages. has learned their lesson. And, and, then, and then won re election by 13 points. Does, does the, the, the atmosphere change when Trump got elected? Love him or hate him, that's just a fact. Does the blue trend in Westchester continue? Does it outlive Donald Trump? Of course it does. It's, it, it, you're seeing it in the registration numbers. And it's not a good thing for the Democrats. The, you How need so? an opposition party. Otherwise, A, you factionalize b within the majority. And two, you don't find yourself being checked intellectually, politically, or, or ethically. And it's, that's, it's, it's a problem not for these Democrats who are good people, but for any party. It's a good and gracious point. But you know, ultimately, I think we're seeing these two parties are, are sticking around. There's only two choices. These pendulums do swing back and forth. Where this, this ain't a pendulum. This is an earthquake. Now, interestingly... We're in the middle of one, but it'll, it'll come in, back. Interestingly, as Westchester appears to be getting bluer and bluer, we're not seeing that extend to Nassau County. Nassau's often compared to Westchester. It's retained a GOP-led county board. Now, both counties and regions are essential if Democrats are going to keep control of the state Senate next year. You guys know more about the differences between Nassau and, and Westchester politics than I do. What's the difference between the two counties, and is this a warning sign for Democrats to try to keep control of the state Senate next if year? If that's Richard? the only thing they have to worry about, then the Democratic Party's in good shape on Long Island. Long Island is demographically different. It, it hasn't experienced the generational and, and uh, ethnographic changes. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the Democratic Party in an even year, because whatever Trump's effect in an odd year where there were no county executive races, come fall of 2020, Democrats are coming out 
in streams. Oh, there's no question in 2020. I mean, Democrats are turning out in, in huge numbers. Republicans will as well, but the registration doesn't match up for Republicans. Nassau has always been a, a very Republican county. Westchester was, mm -hmm. you know, up until the, through the mid 80s, um, early, even early 90s. But um, Nassau is different demographically. It's, it's got okay. more blue collar areas. It's a much more Republican uh, d district. The party is really ingrained it's, throughout its government. It's too. older and whiter as well. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's right. Th th that's gonna, it's going to change in Nassau too, but more slowly. And if, if Republicans are able to make gains in the state Senate on Long Island, it's really going to be Hudson Valley that winds up being the potential firewall. For Democrats, who they're going to keep control of the state Senate? I mean, it's eight seats. I think they have to. Yeah, it's, hold a, it's a lot to of keep. seats. To take. It's, it'd be very difficult to, yeah. it, to take that control. Impo almost yeah. impossible. And even the upstate districts are showing tinges of blueness uh, it, it, that are surprising a lot of people. The Republican Party has committed suicide, and it's not in anyone's interest. I think the, the partisanship is going to stay in New York and in Westchester and the Hudson Valley through the Trump presidency, however long that goes. All right, want to look ahead to 2020 on a couple of different fronts, if we can. First of all, Nita Lowy is giving up her seat in Congress. It's the first time her seat will be open since the calendar began with a 19 and not a 20. So far, State Senator David Carlucci and Assemblyman David Buckwald have declared that they are running in the Democratic field, which brings up some questions. Who's going to get the seat? Are there any other names we should be looking out for? What about on the Republican side? But my first question, there's only one of us on the show today that has been elected to a public office before. Richard Brodsky, any interest in running for that seat? You should do it. I tell you, Bob, it's been a wonderful break <laughs> that we've had for this, yeah. this many yep. months. Yep. We it's good that to way. see you again. <laughs> that's right. Who's your friend? No comment. <laughs> Who's your friend? Let's move on. Let's move. That's interesting. OK. Interesting. Well, I'll ask you a, a follow up question on that next week. You are are there are there going to be a lot of are there more names next week? Yeah, there I is there, no next week. I know I was there being no ironical. <laughs> uh, for years, we heard that the Democrats were lining up for a chance at this seat, and and we're not seeing the avalanche of people coming forward and putting their names in the ring that I expected. Uh, yeah, I'm, why? I'm, and, and I'm surprised what? there's not a big celebrity popping in here. You know, I mean, I, I never thought Chelsea Clinton was going to run. But it's very early, and. You can't Very read early. anybody out of this, including Chelsea Clinton. That's right. The the you got a year and a half. The the it's too soon to pop and make yourself a target this early for an elected official who lives in the district, like Senator Carlucci or Assemblyman Buckwell, both of whom are very good guys. Um, it makes sense to get yourself organized, but the, the, this district invites the same kind of campaign that Nita Lowy engaged in when she got started she was completely unknown at a left field yeah. and she managed to because she could raise the money to win a primary and win a general very she, she had an office job in, in governor cuomo's mario cuomo's nobody State, knew yeah who she nobody knows she was yeah rob astorino's name has been mentioned once or twice about this you worked for astorino on yeah. multiple campaigns and while he was county executive you think he's going to run i mean to, to say that he's been asked would be an understatement he's the the phone jumped off the hook he hasn't ruled it out, but he's happy with where he is. It's also he's he gets politics. He's very attuned to the you know to to the um, On the, what envir the environment. Can he win a race well, that's in 2020? What, no, this is this is what I'm saying. Because he's won that district before. He's won that area before. Pretty handily. He won it in an odd year. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I, it, 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 but is that he, one of the what, is that one of the considerations he's absolutely, had that it's 2020? So he, Donald he hasn't Trump ruled will be on it out. Ballot. But he's frankly he's very happy with his life right now. He's he's doing some really good work. With CNN, he's doing work with Answer the Answer the question. Under what theory can he win the race? Under the theory that he's very well known, he's already very well funded, and he's popular with with a lot of people in Westchester. Give me a couple. They of other, remember the text. Jesus. Give me a couple of other Republican names we might hear about in this there, race. I haven't heard any else, any others thrown in at this point. Hiram P. Ellsworthy is interested. Hiram, he's in. The Ellsworthy boom <laughs> is about to start. <laughs> All right. Too much uh, for the bumper stickers. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, you made the whole, it would fill the whole car. <laughs> yeah. All right, finally, i got to ask you about the biggest political issue in the nation, and that is impeachment. I, I'll ask you to predict what happens later on on this, but just what's your take on the risks and, reward, risks and rewards of impeachment for both the Democrats and the Republicans? I, I want to start with Bill on this. Is, are you, do you think Democrats are in a position to overplay this? No, I, I don't think they are. I, I think the hearings, the hearings that are com coming up are smart, the public hearings. And then this will go to the Senate. So I don't expect the, the Senate to convict. I think the Republicans hold as a party line vote in the Senate pretty much. But I don't think the, De the Democrats have enough goods out there and they have real people testifying that are respected individuals. Some of them were, you know, these are members of Trump's own administration. 
So I don't think it will, it will, it, they have much to lose here. Richard? The, 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 if you want to be calculating about it, st this will enrage the Trump base. Now the Trump base it's was, already, at 38%, right? it was, was already enraged. But as far as motivating turnout, I don't know, maybe. But to everyone's credit, and, and not everyone, but most Democrats, um, they're paying attention to the merits. And even the, the, the changes they made in the process are showing signs of taking it seriously. And to that extent, I think that will come across. And I don't think there'll be much political outcome a year from now from all that. Is the public paying attention? Will they pay attention? The, my fear is that everybody's so entrenched that they're going to hear what they want to hear or, or take out of it the conclusions they want through the process, that nobody's doing this with an open mind in yeah. the public. I, th I mean, I think that's the case, and I think the public already pretty much knows, I, I suspect, what's out there because things have leaked out of the committee. But yeah. now they're going to see it on TV. They're going to see it live with hands note raised. that once the whistleblower report came out, there was a clear, dramatic shift in public opinion. People who were saying, no, 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 That's true. Are now saying, you have to follow the evidence. Uh, I also think Bill was correct in pointing out that the uh, uh, hearings themselves will create their own television reality, which, as we saw in Watergate, matters. We will leave it there. Where does the time go? We've reached our first commercial break on our final episode. When Newsbreakers returns, comedy and comedy in politics. They're in short supply. Perhaps Bill and Richard can help us find them. Welcome back to Newsbreakers as we wrap up or continue our 286th and final episode of the program with our original panelists, Bill O'Reilly and Richard Brodsky. You know, you look good for an old man. An old man, yeah. You really do. I, I'm grayer and fatter. I want to, I'm kidding. You guys have formed a friendship and, and, and you knew each other, I think, a little bit before. I, I, I you never cared for him. You <laughs> still, I don't. I'm sorry. It's, it's the last shot. You gotta be honest. I, yeah. I, I never I cared for him. You, that, that's not what it looks like. You, you had been a panelist together on RFL, but it was really this show that helped, I think, so solidify. Like, it surprised me a little bit how well you guys got along, especially considering how passionate you both are about politics and how polar opposite, well, not well, polar for, opposite, well, for, but... Well, for me, it's strategic, because Richard's a hell of a debater. He's really smart. <laughs> he went to Harvard, this guy, a Harvard lawyer. You know, he's really smart. So I could just smile my way through this and make friends. It cut the edge off a little bit. You know? the, well, but, yeah. I, but I do... Yeah, the, we have made the, the thing friends. that made it possible for the dy TV dynamic to work, as well as the personal dynamic, was, and I, I have to say something nice about myself here as well as Bill. Naturally. Both of us have taken a very careful and principled view of politics and tried to adapt the professional elements, the, the partisan elements, to a core set of principles which matter. Bill's decision to walk from the Republican Party when Trump became the nominee was prescient, important, and a model for how to handle yourself as a partisan in, in when, when a line is crossed. And that underlay the banter, the, the, the conflict, the arguments that we've had. So I, I, I do admire his principled positions, even when he's screamingly wrong, <laughs> which is most of the time. So there's a lot of Republicans who disagree with that. <laughs> yes, yes, there <laughs> They've are. given me H-E double hockey sticks, yeah. Well, no, well, here's my question. Because in our, in our politics in a wider sense, but also in our, our everyday lives, we're going to have Thanksgiving dinner in a few weeks, and there's going to be political bickering at a lot of Thanksgiving tables. How can we apply the lessons of your connection to each other to our wider politics, to our wider lives, because because we're not in a place where we get along. Right. To, I mean, to me, it's not fun if we're just yelling talking points. I mean, if you could do that, you do like you know, crossfire started, and it's each side yelling at each other. It's not honest. It, it, like you have to talk about things in a real way. It's also not social media. The, one of the things that we had to deal with is we weren't anonymous, and if you said something stupid or really rude, there were viewers and professionals who looked at you and said, what'd you do that for? The anonymity of social media is one of the things that has let the, the level of discourse just degrade. Completely. Completely degrade. Um, to the extent you're saying that we, did nev we never fell into that trap, thank you. It's an, an only nice thing, I think, the only nice thing he's there ever said about us. That's a nice thing, yeah. yeah. There have been so, a, there but have been we appreciate it. 
Uh, keep it up. Thank you. But, but again, I, how do we apply this beyond this? Is, are there any, is there a way, can we come back from this partisan divide that it's, we're It's in? very it's difficult hate. to do, and it's There's been, going on. It's been going on for a long time. I mean, in the 90, early 90s, I was running the Metropolitan Republican Club on the east side of Manhattan, a very old, kind of distinguished TR club that's gone a little bit askew in recent years. TR club? You know, it was Teddy Roosevelt. The, the, okay. Yeah, he, he founded it in 1902. And I wanted to invite, I noticed in the old yearbooks, there, were, there was always a table at the annual Met Ball. And um, there was always a table to, um, for the Democratic district leaders. And when I became president, I said, I'm going to bring that back. And so I talked to a Democratic district leader that I was friendly with and said, would you guys like to come? And she said, don't even start this. This isn't happening. And I talked to a Republican district leaders, and they said, this isn't going to happen. No way. And I was shocked. And that was I, during a much less terse well, times than it's today. It's not a partisan divide. There are still Republicans and Democrats who can talk to each other. It's a cultural divide in which there's a rough party alignment. It's cultural, that's right. But it's, it, it's not the people in the elites who are unwilling to deal with each other. They may n choose not to because of underlying politics, but there's a grassroots sense that if you're not with us, you're really against us and you're traitorous. That's, again, I think, a function of social media that's and right. an unhinged willingness to uh, say or do almost anything. Yeah, and, th and that's also a function of independent expenditure campaigns. It's a function on, on all sides. You, if you step out of line as an elected official or as a campaign, you will pay a heck of a price. You will be knocked from office. And also hold the Democratic and Republican parties responsible. The Democratic elite left its historic concern for average people, and the Hillary candidacy became the model for that. The Republican Party got taken over by Tea Party activists who were crazed in many ways. And both parties invited an extreme and unhistoric, ahistoric uh, uh, change in their fundamental constituencies. You can't <laughs> be a Republican if you're not for Trump anymore. You can't be a Democrat if you're not. And, you know, and, and, and I miss the Tea Party because they were, they were, they stood for fiscal responsibility and that's what kills me. I consider myself one of them. You guys are depressing me and I was already depressed before we started oh, this. I got more. Give me some, give me a positive. Is there any, give me some I'm reason for hope. I'm positive there's no hope. <laughs> I'm <laughs> positive, you're right. <laughs> you wanted a positive? This, it, I mean, I, I, it's I, hopeless. The, the, the more alarming thing is, you know, if we have time oh, for good. this, yes, the more, more alarming, alarming thing, I mean, I've worked in, in politics professionally since 1986, it's a long time. And I do the propaganda side, which was, you know, you can't use that word anymore. Goebbels ruined it for everybody. But, um, <laughs> but you know, our job, you know, with, on my side or, or on, the, on the counterparts on the Democratic side were to take basic facts and you spin them as much as you can. Right. You can spin turnips into gold. That's all fine. But, but today, with digital media and the rest of it and the diminishing local news you know, services, you can get away with anything. Last week, Zuckerberg said okay. in Washington that they're not going to fact check anything that goes on Facebook. It's a problem. Voters are going to have to educate themselves. Uh, any, anybody else ready for a drink? <laughs> <laughs> uh, only one more time that I can say that Newsbreakers is going away and coming back after a commercial break, and I just said it. Predictions and farewells are next. Welcome back to what is now the final segment of this final edition of Newsbreakers. I'm Andrew Whitman. As we continue with our original Newsbreaker panelists, Republican Bill O'Reilly and Democrat Richard Brodsky. As you may recall, and as Richard never lets me forget, we used to do weekly predictions on this program. We've not had a chance to grade any since we altered the show's format in April. So I went back and did some grading. So let's go over a few as we cue the music one last time. I'm only telling you about two of these predictions. Back on March 16th, I asked a pair of questions. Would either Andrew Cuomo or Bill de Blasio run for president? You both said neither would. Now, Cuomo Correct. did not. He <laughs> did. De Blasio <laughs> did, but just no, barely. No, no. Just barely. You're kidding. He was you joking. You, <laughs> You're went, kidding. you wanted comedy, right? He you ran for went, president? You both went one for uh, where two was I? on that one. And speaking of funny, since I know how much Richard loves sports questions, Back on February 9th, I asked how many games the Knicks would lose last season. Richard said 68 games. Bill went with 67. One of you played a Price is Right game here. The actual answer was 65 oh, losses. God. So oh, man. Bill gets that point. There were other predictions to grade, but to save time, let's jump right to the final He's scoreboard for 2019. Bill wins the title oh. with two more correct answers, 60% to 56%. Thank God Richard. we cut the year short. Bill, congratulations. Here is the crown, and you get 15 seconds of airtime to tell us how you feel. How I feel? I feel very wise. 
Hold it up. Hold it up. There it I is. I feel. Um, That's all you got. Yeah. yeah. You finally win one, and you're right. all give, you yeah. do is give me the crown back. <laughs> give me the crown back. Because to put a bow on this program, I also went back and looked at all the Just results sorry. from the past five plus years uh -oh. of Newsbreakers predictions. In review, Bill, you won the crown in 2019 and in our original season spanning 2014 and 2015. Richard, I have you down as the title winner in 16, oh, 17, and 18. And Richard also goes down as the overall predictions champion. 62%, huh? 562 questions That's we've graded over Why these years. Why did you give him a crown? You're, you're both above, because you've both won over the years. You're both above 50, 60%. Winners, yeah, we all get Richard. trophies. Okay. Richard, 12 more correct answers than Very Bill nice. over the years. On behalf of the job. Academy, 15 seconds. I want to return this to Andrew, who was an unfair, biased, <laughs> and completely bogus. No, no. It was fun. I'm glad we did it. Um, predictions make you accountable. And even if they're on sports stuff, so you can go back later and say, you know, you were wrong, and I'm glad we did it. Well, that... That's a perfect setup because now I can ask you some prediction questions that I cannot hold you accountable for because we're not coming back on the show. So we can't do a new show without uh, doing some new predictions. Again, we're never going to be able to grade them, but here we go anyway. Let's uh, move right on on impeachment. Will he be impeached? Will he be removed? Which party will benefit more from the process, electorally at least? And then the real question everybody wants an answer to, will Donald Trump win another term or be defeated in 2020? That's assuming he's on the ballot. Richard? <laughs> Will he be impeached? Yes. Will he be removed? No. Will it hurt the Democrats or the Republicans Neither. more electorally? It'll be a push. It'll Will be a he push be reelected in 20? No. Bill. I'm going to go. Will he be impeached? He'll be impeached, yes. He won't be convicted. Uh, it will hurt the Republicans more. And um, what was the last question? Will Trump be reelected in 2020? N no. There's too many factors between now and then, but I'd say no. Well, Stick we'll have to get together at a bar or something yeah. over the next Bill, week. on behalf of the Academy, this was well, well yeah. and truly done. Yeah, well and truly done. We are just smart. about out of time on Newsbreakers and here on Fios One. Time only for our final thoughts. Bill, 30 seconds. To yeah, I just want to say it, this has been really great. This has been a lot of fun. Getting to know you, Richard, has been a, a, a real treasure to me. You were always very intimidating from the outside, and you're actually well, a very you're I, actually a teddy bear close up. I agree with Bill. It's been fun for him to get to know me. <laughs> And Andrew, you've been a wonderful host and a friend. You, you both become friends. I also think that the, to the extent we are able to add something to the local news scene, to what people care about in their communities, to what's going on in the Hudson Valley, I think it really, this really matters. They, whatever our individual strengths and weaknesses fall by the wayside, people need to have these kinds of conversations. They need to have them with a little comedy and a little comedy. It's a good line. It, it is, and to, for better or worse, I'm glad, uh, Bill, you've been a great friend and partner, and I'm glad we had this opportunity. You should run for that seat. You're an actual public servant. Move on. Gentlemen, thank you both. It's been an honor. It's been a privilege. It's been a headache, uh, and it's been terrific working with you both. I've, I really appreciate it. As for me, uh, I want to begin uh, with a regret, my only one where this program is concerned, that it took me some time to figure out what this show was and could be and that time wound up being wasted. I hope news, Newsbreakers served a purpose and that in that service it was a net positive. I, I know we tried. I tried to find time over the past few weeks to thank the people who worked behind the scenes to make this show possible each week and for each of the past 286 weeks. But I need to mention our top editorial staff, news directors, assistants, managing editors, executive producers who have helped make my work for Fios One even better. I need to thank both Verizon and RNN for making this program possible. I also want to thank the hidden helpers of the people who appeared here each week, the staffers, the press secretaries, the public affairs people, the ones who took my requests and questions and pressures and bad jokes. You know who I'm talking to, right? I thank you all as well. And of course, my thanks to you at home for making any of this matter at all. I will miss you. I'll miss the debates and conversations. I'll miss shining a spotlight on ordinary people who do extraordinary things or are just willing to bring their perspectives into the court of public opinion. As for me, I'm moving up the dial a few channels. I'll be at RNN. You can see me each weeknight at 6 on RFL. We have an election to cover, an impeachment to navigate, and who knows what next. And as to the rest, about this change that no one saw coming and no one really wanted, there's not a lot I can say, so I'll lean on and alter the words of a far better writer than myself. It could have kept on growing, or even just kept on. We had a good thing going. Going. That'll do it for Newsbreakers. On behalf of the hundreds of people who have worked for Fios One over these past years, I'm Andrew Whitman. We will not be back next weekend, nor likely ever again, but we'll see you all soon somewhere 
in this region you all call home and we all call home together. Here's hoping you keep these conversations in our absence going as we pass the baton to all of you.